Welcome to the Math Ed Podcast. I'm Sam Otten from the University of Missouri at Columbia, and this fall we hosted the PMENA 2019 Conference. That's the annual research conference of the North American Chapter of the International Group for the Psychology of Mathematics Education, or PMENA. It's held every year in the United States, Mexico, or Canada, and this year for its 41st meeting, we held the conference in beautiful St. Louis, Missouri, right next to the fully renovated Gateway Arch Riverside Park. In this special episode of the podcast, you will be able to hear the opening plenary of PMENA 2019, which featured two education scholars from right there in St. Louis. The first presenter is Dr. William Tate, who is a past president of the American Educational Research Association, the current dean of the graduate school, and a professor of education in African and African American studies at Washington University in St. Louis, and he's also a former mathematics teacher. The second presenter is Dr. Jerome Morris who is the E. Desmond Lee Endowed Professor of Urban Education at the University of Missouri at St. Louis, and a co-founder of the Education for Liberation Coalition. At PMENA, Dr. Tate and Dr. Morris gave a presentation about the power of regimes in society, and they called for a new kind of brain regime that could support mathematical attainment. It's really an honor. I want to thank you uh, for the invitation uh, to participate in PME. I haven't been to one of these meetings before. I have read the proceedings over the years, and actually, um, as a doctoral student, I was remembering, like, these were the first set of papers I read um, because they were just right there. I was a Maryland grad, and they were always there in our, our room for math ed, and so a tremendous honor, and to do it also with my colleague, Jerome Morris, is very special for me. So I want to thank all the organizing committees, and I've been engaged a lot with folks from the University of Missouri system who've been very kind. Thank you very much. Um, I want to talk to you a bit about regimes today. Um, that's my title, Building Regional uh, Brain Regimes. You might say, well, why are we talking about brain regimes? And first, what the heck does a regime have to do with math education? And I'll try to explain that um, as I go along. I want to thank um, all the people who've helped me. I've been at uh, Washington University for 17 years, and so everything I'm going to say to you is about really accumulation of information and knowledge that we've been working on as a team for 17 years now. Uh, all these folks have been uh, instrumental in it. I have no conflicts. Um, no one's paying me to say this. I'm being recorded, I'm, but I'm going to be unplugged, I promise you. Let me start by saying that um, it's important for you to know um, at a psychology conference that what I'm really going to be trying to explain to you is how I'm thinking about my work in the context of community psychology. For me, that goes beyond the individual and looks at the broader social, cultural, economic, political and uh, international influences that change development in human beings. And so while I may not be approaching psychology in the way some of you do, um, I promise you that psychology undergirds what I'm talking about today. There are several questions that, uh, guide, um, that are gonna guide me, but, but first let me offer you this. Um, if you were to have a chance to look outside, and we, we talked about the arch, but there are also um, stadiums out there. You'll see if you go further towards, um, towards the east, really a little bit to the south, um, this Cardinal Stadium. I mean, we're, we've got a great team here if you keep up with baseball. It's amazing. But there's also another stadium um, that sits empty, and it's where the Rams used to play. Um, you know, they left us. Um, and I'm going to say this. Um, it was interesting, and I, I believe you were here when it happened. Um, when, when it was announced that the Rams were going to leave, um, this community organized itself rapidly, and we came up with $450 million to build a new stadium right there next to the arch to keep the Rams here. That was a powerful moment of public-private partnerships coming together to keep an industry here that causes brain damage. <laughs> it, it's amazing to me, and I say to all that um, we have the very best sports regime in the United States with the Cardinals, uh, we brought a soccer team here, and we were able to organize public-private very quickly, very rapidly to try to keep that team here. I will also say to you, and I know Professor Morris has maybe chat with you about it as well, that um, we have another regime here that's one of the most effective in the history of these types of regimes, and it's a segregation regime. Our ability to organize public-private partnerships to segregate human beings is elite. 
Oftentimes, we don't think of regimes as being effective. You know, you just don't think about it that way. You, you just say, what do you mean? Is this guy crazy saying it's elite? It's darn good. It's one of the very best that was ever created. These partnerships between churches, between government agencies, between individuals who uh, had a private interest was impactful to our community to this very day. I mean, this, this conference is foregrounded in many respects. I saw on Twitter talking about the Michael Brown situation. Well, in fact, those situations were created and designed largely by partnerships, public and private. So our segregation regime is elite. Our sports regime is elite. Our segregation regime is elite. I want to talk to you about why we can't have elite brain regimes in the United States of America. Places where we come together as public entities and private entities to protect the brains of children, allow them to nurture and flourish, and in the case of you, flourish in mathematical sciences. Why can't we do that? What's in the way? So several questions will guide what I'm going to say, and I'm going to try to go even faster, is that I'm talking about geography today, and so you should know what the first law of geography is. Some of you might know. We'll see in a second. And then I'm going to ask a question, does this law have anything to do with understanding opportunity to learn in mathematics? I'm going to ask and answer the question now and tell you it does. <laughs> and, and then I'm going to say, what are some of the important lessons that we need to learn? So first, very quickly, the first law of geography is simple. Nearby things are more similar than distance things. So the closer things are in terms of proximity, the more likely they are to be related in some form or fashion. It's just a very clean, simple thing. And I know in math, that's, that's, you guys have it. Ladies and gentlemen, you got it down. Now, what does that really mean in the context of community? And I said I was going to talk from a community psychology perspective. If we had a model, a very simple one, um, we would simply say that uh, people live in community and that they get a chance to experience in their community a pre-K through 12 education and informal education like museums, zoos, botanical gardens, and things of that sort. And depending on the community type, there's a positive or a negative relationship between the community and those informal and formal learning environments. When they're positive, really great things happen. Um, those students end up in a cycle of going to post-secondary education of some sort. They end up in the workforce. It's a net positive in terms of family support, tax revenue, and political support. That feeds back into the community in a positive way. And that positive cycle happens over and over in space. And it's geospatially driven, instantiated everywhere across this country. However, when that relationship is negative, between the community and the schools, negative things happen. Something like dropout or welfare recipients or poor health outcomes, that feeds back in the same way into those communities with poor human capital development, less money in terms of tax revenue, fewer and fewer political supports, that feeds back into community and that becomes ingrained as well. And that cycle is real and that's called the United States of America. Now you might think you're off the hook. You're in math education. You're not part of the regime. But point of fact, when I was beginning my career as a mathematics teacher and then moving on into to graduate education, there were many calls by NCTM and other organizations for certain things to happen in our community. And the first one was, of course, the math for all. And of course, algebra for all, which turned into geometry for all, which turned into algebra two for all. And the science people had the same thing going. Biology for all, and then it became chemistry for all, and then it was physics for all. And by the way, it all merged at the same time across states, across geospatial things. I don't have time to talk to you about the politics of it all, but largely I attribute it to what I call the Arkansas effect, when, when Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton were in Arkansas, he was leading the National Governors Association, and they were able to get and receive that message from professional societies and push that agenda forward through governors, and that manifests itself in state policies called mandates that mandated math and science at a certain level across the United States. You too in math education are part of a regime, and I call it the math regime, a public-private partnership that led to something that you thought was going to be very good. 
The theory of action was simple. The more cognitively demanding the mathematics, the better the outcomes were for the students. They're going to be able to go to college. They're going to have this rich set of experiences. It's going to be lovely. That was the theory of action. I remember it. I could speak it well. I was even part of it. You see, I was in a regime too. Now, what really happened, my colleagues and I who work um, in epidemiological studies related to public health apply some of those same techniques to what happened with the spread of mandates across the United States with respect to math and science. This is what it looked like in 1980. The lighter the blue is, or the more blue it is, the higher the requirements are. So over time, in the 80s, the requirements were quite low if you were teaching in that time period. There were very few math and science requirements across, the, across states. And then they began to intensify in the 1990s. Some of you know about the NCT standards and all those things that call for more. By 2000, most states had very significant requirements in math and science at the high school level with the theory of action that more and more people were going to graduate from college. Has anybody ever tested that or do you just believe it? Because when you're in a regime, it's ideologically driven. I didn't believe it because I had really been in real schools and I was asking myself, this has to be having an effect that is unintended. And so we tested it to see what would happen. I'm going to be as quick as I can. We had three um, outcome measures, whether the people were pushed out of school as a result of what happened with raising the cognitive demand, whether or not they enrolled in college, or whether they actually attained a, de a degree. Some of the dropout data, over time, you can see it's not surprising. Um, the highest dropouts occurred with black men, um, next Hispanic men. Um, blacks overall had a very um, high rate of dropout in our data set. This was a national data set across the United States of America. Um, the largest impact on dropout um, that we found uh, overall it was in the sample was like 1% increase as a result of the increased requirements. You might say that doesn't mean anything, but I'm going to explain to you what it really means. The greatest increases happened for black and Hispanic men. Um, not surprising. They uh, benefited the least in terms of what, when you raise the demand in schools in this way. What does it really cost? A 1% uh, reduction in the national high school dropout rate is equated with 400 fewer murders and 8,000 fewer assaults. That's a true cost. Um, a 1% reduction for all men between the ages of 20 and 60 um, saves the United States as much as $1.4 billion in reduced costs related to crime. Remember my theory of community? It just eliminates that in significant ways. If you think about just from the California dropout project alone, I don't know how many people here from California, but dropping out, um, there was a range in terms of the cost between $53,000 per person to $392,000 per person. Um, this is demographically specific. Um, white women, if they drop out, it costs the state about $53,000 because they largely don't end up in jail. If a black man drops out, it costs the state close to $392,000 because they end up in jail. So when we talk about it being non-trivial, that's not the reality. Raising the cognitive demand actually has significant impacts on the lives of people. The math regime was part of it. College enrollment was not affected. There was no change. So that theory, so if you're going around telling people that we're raising the standards in math because we want more and more people to go to college, it's not empirically valid. That's not what happened. And I don't believe you can project forward and say it's going to happen either. And I, I'm going to ask you why in a minute. Some subgroups were less likely to go to college. In fact, you saw a 5% decrease in Hispanic men. If we had just left them alone, more of them would have gone to college. There was also a decrease in Hispanic women as well. When you think about that in terms of just what it means for your life, um, if you don't have a high school diploma, um, you know, you're not adding a whole lot to your life. Any college, and I'll tell people this, it's better to go to college and flunk out than not go at all. So if we created an incentive for people not to go or push them out in some way, we actually cost them time on their life. It's a real cost. Now there was some benefit for some subgroups if you, uh, in, in, in the way we condition this. So if an African American woman finished high school, she had a, almost a 3% increased chance of going off to college. 
And if a Hispanic man actually finished and made it through, they had almost a 6% chance. That's huge, extremely impactful. The question I have for you is, why didn't this really have the intended effect that it should? I'm going to answer it quickly. Because if you mandate something and you add no capacity at all, why do you think something different is going to happen? That's just illogical. We do not raise the standards in any entity and not add human capital value and resources and think that anything different is going to happen in any other field except for education. So one of the things that I, I want to highlight is that we have different models. Um, this is an opportunity propensity model that was done by Burns and Miller out of Temple. And some of the things that they talk about are important for what, what I'm going to say. So foregrounding what I'm going to say in the future, they talk a little bit about prior achievement, a lot about opportunity factors, opportunity, one of them being school climate. We tend not to deal with school climate a lot in math ed. It, it, it's sort of on the periphery. Um, but I think school climate is very important. I want to foreground that as well. Self-regulation, which manifests itself in discipline, is extremely important. This discipline question um, was recently answered in a big study from Stanford. Some of you may have seen it, where they looked at the relationship between discipline and what was happening with uh, academic achievement, and they found that they were interdependent. Like literally, it was, it was almost causal that when, when there's a discipline problem, the lower math scores are manifesting themselves, and I want to talk about that. It's extremely important because we've been working on that for 17 years and I want to give you what I learned here in our context. Very quickly, how many of you have your cell phone? I want you to ask Siri a question. Ask Siri, what is the temperature in Missouri? Yes. Maybe Siri will answer you, I don't know. What does Siri say? If you told me that Siri told you what the temperature was in Missouri, I'm going to say you're telling a fib. It's always going to be specific to a locale, right? And it may depend on where your phone is from or whatever, but Siri was programmed to tell you specifically about a locale, not a state as a unit of analysis, but wherever you are. It might have told you what was happening in St. Louis, Jeff City, yeah. might have said Columbia, that's right. This equation that I'm showing you does exactly that. So all I'm going to talk to you about, I don't want to explain GIS to a bunch of math ed people, right? But I'm going to say to you this, that there's a way to take an equation and take state data and get a local weather report or a local achievement report for the variables that you're looking at. That's what we're going to do right now, because I want to know what's happening locally. And, you know, I've been studying St. Louis, but I want to know in a comparative fashion what's happening in the state of Missouri. That's extremely important. So let's look at the relationship between our Algebra 1 scores and free and reduced lunch. The only place that that relationship is actually statistically significant in our state is in uh, metropolitan St. Louis and then down into the Boot Hill area which is a rural area, and over in Kansas City and in St. Joe. Very interesting, it's a negative relationship obviously, the higher the um, percentage of free or reduced lunch in schools, the lower the algebra scores. And that yellow area is Ferguson Florissant, just in memory of Michael Brown. So that was what was happening in his school context. We keep going, if we go percent minority, uh, minority in the state of Missouri is black. With blacks, are, really, there, there, there aren't a lot of other, it doesn't rise up with other minorities, not like California, Illinois. So really this is percent black. And the places where you see the relationships being statistically significant between algebra scores and school, um, the school uh, level data percent minority is in Metro St. Louis, the Boot Hill, and Kansas City. Now I'm going to stop right now because I'm really going to be talking to you about uh, St. Louis area. But it's important for me to say to a group of educators that we tend to ignore the rural areas. It's very easy to spend our time talking about urban areas with all their assets and challenges. But the rural areas are really forgotten. And I do not want to continue that mythology like they could just be ignored, like everything is going well with them. It is not. Now today I'm going to talk to you about urban, but I, I just really want to hit that home um, today. 
free and reduced lunch and graduation rates, the only place that's statistically significant and negative is in Kansas City and St. Louis Metro. Same deal with free and reduced lunch and dropout. We have Kansas City, St. Louis Metro, but the Boot Hill also popped as well. So remember the rural folks, it's, it's extremely important. Now let's talk about what I really want to get to is this discipline issue. The relationship between discipline rates in schools and algebra scores, where it was statistically significant was St. Louis and Kansas City. And really, that's shocking. I mean, that's something we, I mean, I don't know if any of you ever thought about that school climbing factor, the school discipline. And I want to dig a little deeper very quickly. In um, terms of suspension rates, Missouri is number one, or was um, in this particular survey, between uh, black and whites. It was a, uh, had the highest gap between black and white students at the elementary level. And according to the Office of Civil Rights, of the one, two, three, four, five, six highest suspending school, district, suspending school districts in the United States of America, three of them are in Metro St. Louis. Amazingly high. These are the highest in the United States of America. Reasons for suspen uh, uh, suspensions. In the St. Louis public, almost 4,000 kids were suspended in 2014, a year we benchmark off Michael Brown's life. 1,400 of them were elementary school students, 200 in kindergarten, and eight were preschoolers. And the primary reason was a term called insubordination or disrespect. Now, I want to I wanna marinate on that for just a moment. This is a set of reasons that people were lynched in the South. And the ones in red, the reasons are the things that you often hear people in education talk about when they talk about little people. If you drill down to it, most of them have to do with insubordination and disrespect. Now, I'm not suggesting to you that these young people were being lynched. What I'm suggesting to you is that we were ending their opportunity structure, tantamount putting them in that cycle that I talked to you about earlier that spins in a negative way, in intergenerational fashion, and that locks them in to the lowest forms of opportunity that exist in our society. So I don't have to kill you to kill you. We don't talk about why we have these discipline problems. But I want to share with you just a few things in a few moments I have left, because I'm giving myself a hard stop. If we looked at childhood mental health in Metro St. Louis, the northern sector, which is predominantly black, has very high levels of mental health disorders. And if we ask ourselves, well, what's happening to the young people who have these mental health disorders, there's a high preponderance of them that are being triaged in emergency rooms. They're not getting real care. They're simply going there, they're, they're giving them an aspirin, as my grandfather used to say, God bless them, and sending them home. What does that aspirin have to do with the mental health disorder? Very few of, the, of these young people in this uh, metropolitan region are having any inpatient hospitalization, counseling services. We don't even have nurses anymore. You all know they're gone. There's nothing there for them. But we have got great cognitive demand and wonderful standards. Prenatal health, massively important for mental health and cognitive demand if we're protecting the brain. We already know in our metropolitan region there's huge disparities between black and white students in terms of the type of prenatal care they get and the, and the, and the care that mothers receive. And it's, it's all racially based. If you want to think about mathematics, it might help if you had a decent meal before you started. However, where most of these young people live, it's a food desert. They have said in our newspapers that it's an experiment to put a reasonable place to purchase food in some of these neighborhoods. It's an experiment. I want you all to ponder that way you think about all the things you're asking students to do in schools. They don't have Whole Foods up there, people. There's no Starbucks. There's none of that. This is what these young people are negotiating. If you look at the health insurance, which we refuse to expand, the Medicare, Medic we, we just refuse to do it in, in, in this state, even though we have data on the cost benefit of it at scale. The one thing I will leave you with this is this. 
You can have child-based insurance, but when the kid is the only one in the family that has insurance, we know in public health that those kids don't get the insurance care. It's only when the family has insurance that the mother and fathers are able to use it in ways that are distinct and at an order of magnitude in terms of academic achievement. That is done, that research is done by economists who have nailed the fact that if you really wanted to have high cognitive demand with math, you would have health insurance for every young person. Nothing you could do would ever have the effect size of that in mathematics education, ever. No textbook, no intervention you have would ever change their math trajectory more than if they had health insurance. In North St. Louis, it's an experiment, literally, if they're gonna have a physician or a dentist. I'm not gonna pour over the data, but you can see it for yourself, and I, I may have some of it in the paper. It's literally, there are no physicians, dentists, or nurses there. When I say it's abandoned, there's no food, there's no medicine. I don't even want to show you a picture because I don't want to treat the people in that way. I want you to understand the actual demographics of what they're dealing with. North St. Louis is not different than many other places across the United States, rural and urban. So why can't we have a brain regime? We put $400 million up within six weeks for industry that causes brain injury. Why can't we have prenatal care at scale? Why can't we have a consumer report on quality preschool environments? We have lots of preschool environments, but we don't really know how, how good they are, and then we know they vary. Why can't we have an expansion of health care and health insurance for families? Why can't we deal with, and I didn't even talk about the disparities, the number of people being taught in middle schools in our community by people who have the equivalent of an associate's degree is shameful. But the cognitive demand on standards going up weekly and weekly, and we're all saying yes, 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 not asking a foundational question of who actually is going to be teaching these kids and implementing it. We all know teacher effects are greater than school effects. Why aren't we talking? I mean, it's just shameful. I mean, literally, and I don't want to be mean-spirited to anybody who volunteers as a, a, a wealthy middle-class kid who might say, I want to go and work in an urban area or maybe a rural area. I'm not mad at those kids. If they decide to go do that and invest in those programs, because we have fundamentally failed and haven't invested in making sure the teaching is valued the way it should be. Why can't we have a robust pre-K-12 or pre-K-8 science and math education? Why is that so hard in America? It's just stunning to me. We mandated all of those classes for secondary and did nothing in any way or fashion that you could point to it from an engineering design at scale for math and science pre-K through eight. What did you think was gonna happen? How can we still have these massive disparities in terms of funding? Like, you know, when I, used to, when I lived, when my kids came here, they redshirted the teachers in the community I live in. They would finish a great teacher ed program, and they would pay them not to teach, but to sit and watch the other teachers teach, and then let them teach after a couple years of redshirting, just like a football player from Alabama. It's stunning to me how different it is for kids. Why do we still have food deserts? Why are we reclaiming all these people we pushed out? You want to do something in math education? We pushed out a ton of people. Go back and get them. They're out here in our systems. They need help, but nobody's calling, uh, nobody's doing anything about it. We're just saying, oh, they dropped out. What do you think happened? They dropped out, and now where are they? They're in your neighborhoods, they're in our community. They need help. You know, all I have for you now is references. Thank you. First thing I'd like to do, I'd like to thank the organizing committee also for inviting me to participate in this scholarly intellectual exchange with Dr. William Tate. And one of the things that I'm, I am doing is that Bill had the a paper he was writing on regarding brain regimes. And so what I'm going to do, I have an addendum to that. And so I'm going to offer some suggestions as well as um, make some comments and some, some statements here. But also I'd like to, um, before I begin, I'd like to recognize there are a group of students who are in my class at OMSU. Can you raise your hand, please? Where are you? All right. I've got these guys in the back. I've talked to them. 
So I said, hey, we'll come up with a plan. <laughs> and the course is focusing on issues around identity and community and understanding how that influences the ways in which one goes into a classroom and works with young people. So I'm going to talk about challenging ideologies, cultivating cognition, and rekindling communally bonded schools. And one of the things I want to say, and I know this is a psychology of mathematics, am I correct here? What do we see in terms of the alliance between mathematics and psychology historically? The answer to that is that we generally see that both fields had notions, rigid notions of intellectual abilities of people and consequently relegated people primarily by race and gender to certain categories and really elevated white men to the forefront. And so there's a strange alliance between psychology and mathematics because this alliance has, this, has been enduring and produced indelible effects. They have major consequences for people today. So one of the first things I think we have to do, we talk about building these brain regimes. The first thing we have to do is how are we looking at people in terms of intellectual capacity and or ability, as well as their brain itself. So how do we think about that? And how do we think about people not just within the United States, racially, ethnically, and gender-wise, but also globally? How have ideals or ideologies shape the way we think that people can do or not do mathematics and to be thinking. So one of the things I want to say is that this brain regime piece is powerful here. But I think you gave some wonderful examples here regarding the sports regime and how there's something in this sports regime that people just quickly pull together $500 million and say, hey, we'll make this work. But there's something in the sports regime an incentive in the sports regime that sometimes, I know an economist, you an economist too. Where? Going to bad day. You gotta think about it. There's money, right? There's money here. And so we must not ignore the economics of all of this and how money factors into this conversation around building regimes. So how can we, do we do it altruistically? in terms of brain regimes, or should money be driving? And I saw that you provided the social costs to not doing that. And so that's a way of approaching it. But the other thing is that I want to just take this sports regime and how money is so pivotal in terms of that. One of the things you mentioned about, we would, the, St. Louis would spend $500 million on sports regimes, but you know, it's not just St. Louis. It's really built into the DNA of American society in terms of this being enamored with sports. And there's some scholars that have written a piece in the Harvard Education Review, and they talk about how U.S. public schools' sponsorship of tackle football is ethically indefensible and inconsistent with their educational aims. Their argument relies on three ethical principles and a growing body of evidence that many students who play football suffer traumatic brain injury and cognitive impairment that undermine their academic success and life prospects, whether or not they suffer concussions. And so you mentioned, them, you talked about this, but it still goes on. And I'm arguing that there's a, a unique relationship between developing the brain and developing bodies. Yeah. Okay, there's a unique relationship, and there's really this mind-body dualism that is part of um, European philosophy, Western thought, around bodies and minds. But what I'm saying is that this conversation around mind-body dualism is very pivotal in understanding what goes on. And it's also important um, in terms of understanding sports. Just look at this here. I wish you could see this. Here. You can see, okay. But look at this here. You see the percentage of high school football players recruited by Division I school. Where do you see a disproportionate number of the recruits of Division I school major college revenue generating spectator sports coming from, period. South. Where do they come from? The South. The South. What does geography have to do with it? What does history have to do with it? I was about to say, what does love got to do with it? <laughs> <laughs> but I what does race have to do with it? Oh, no, where, where my brain was going. 
But what does race have to do with it? When you look at it, you see this nexus of race, geography, and class, and region. All this is going on together here. And we see in the South, if you see the darker red states, these are the schools that, that are going to be playing in the national championship. Georgia, most likely. Florida, <laughs> most likely. Louisiana. Who lives in the South disproportionately? If any demographic, if you said most people came from there, where would most black people in the United States come from or called their home? Okay, historically. Up until really 1920, 90% of all black people lived in 10 states. These are all those states down in the South. And I've done work around there in terms of the significance of the South and understanding. But I'm bringing all this to kind of come into this conversation around brain regimes here is to illustrate that these areas, though um, one out of 10 high school football players is recruited by a major division one school, I want to juxtapose that with poverty in the South. And a lot of people say, well, you know, you have poor people who are white, and these are public school children. White people in the South who are poor, black people in the South who are poor. But what do you notice about the, the proportionality of poverty? Louisiana, 44% of public school children, black public school children, are growing up in poverty, compared to 9% of white public school children. So there's a unique alliance in terms of um, sports and poverty in the South. And I, I say this because one of the things that I did, I played college football, and I grew up in Birmingham, Alabama. I didn't know all this regime was affecting me. You know, and all this money made in that. And there's a colleague at University of Georgia, used to be there, Billy Hawkins, talks about um, college sports really are generating billions of dollars. And is, is it ironic that most of these Southern schools are part of that conversation? And so when you talked about this whole notion of, um, you said by dropping out of high school, black males, it costs about $350,000. Might it be connected to the prison industrial complex? And so that's one of the things. So there's money in black bodies. And these black bodies are important in terms of generating revenue, just like we see on the football field, but also not in the classroom. Somebody said, we need to get a population of people ready to play sports to continue a new plantation system. And the major revenue generate sports are basketball and football. So one of the things I want to do, though, is um, there are ways of trying to challenge these ideological beliefs. I had done some work around, I led a black achievement study in the metro Atlanta, Georgia area. There was a young man I had spoken with, interviewed, talked to his family, researched, and it was multi high schools and everything there in Georgia. But one of the things, um, this young man, his family had to fight tooth and nail to get him into the high achievers elementary school. His mother and his uncle, because they understood the implication that if they didn't get him in there, then he was doomed. And so they fought, even though he didn't do well, the cutoff scores were, I mean, he didn't make it. But they forced him, they, they really petitioned and got him in there. And then lo and behold, eight years later, he has a 3.8 GPA in the highest, the most elite school in the region. Second, he scores 92 percentile on the SAT. He receives the top university scholarship. I worked at the University of Georgia. He received the most prestigious scholarship, but this student had not made the cutoff score early on. And so what that is saying is that there are people who would challenge that. I'm going to show you, and he happened to play sports. And he talks about it, I call him Jamel. And this is from the interview, ethnographic interview. He said, throughout high school, my academic record is what people knew me for. So with that, it was a little hard because every once in a while, you would have a teacher who was somehow who was somewhat new to the school or didn't know, you know, know of me. They'd, all, they'd, they'd assume I was slacking or something like that when I had already finished. So it was a little hard because it's like having to prove yourself, you know, because that football was never the focus. It was academics so you can play football, not football so you can get by on academics. Um, there's a piece coming out on Teachers College Record. Former graduate student of mine uh, worked with me, Dr. Adeoye Adeyemo, who's doing a postdoc at UIC. 
he's, um, he and I have collaborated. He did some similar work in Chicago, so we pulled together a comparative study looking at um, black male students who play sports, but he's really pushing that field great. I really applaud him. Just want to know that. The other thing that um, I like to talk about is that Dr. Tate talked about sports regimes, and I talked about this notion of challenging ideologies. But another thing, another one is um, you mentioned about the sake of all project by Dr. Jason Brunel, you and colleagues at WashU who are doing work around that. You talked about prenatal care and highlight this notion of cognition and how do we cultivate cognition. And breastfeeding health and intelligence. There's a scholar doing public health educator, Mary Muse, who's doing some work around breastfeeding among African American women. And really, how do we look at successful breastfeeding among African American families and in many ways reclaiming that heritage that was lost? Why is that important? It's important because there's a positive link between breastfeeding and children's health and intelligence. I know the prenatal is crucial, early childhood education is crucial. And we talked about food deserts, but one of the things I think we have to talk about too are the first foods and the how important it is to get these first foods. And we need to be talking about in terms of black American people and building brain regimes, including breastfeeding as integral to that overall process of that, because we see the benefits of breastfeeding, not just in terms of educational or cognitively, we also see the help, not just for the child, but also for the mother. And one of the things, um, another thing I was reading your paper, Dr. Tate, you mentioned about community and how do we build these brain regimes. And it, it's very important to understand that brains reside in people, right? People live, are part of families. Families are part of communities. Communities are part of a structure, and schools are part of communities. And so we have this, as you mentioned, this symbiosis between, I mean, among schools, family, and communities, and young people participating in these environments. So we have to think about brains, cultivating young people's brains within the context of families, schools, and communities. But how do you do that when there's been divestment in communities, people, communities have been depopulated, when there have been social policies, economic policies, political forces that have really, a barrage of forces that have attacked and undermined historically black and brown communities in the form of educational policy. Some of it was desegregation. Some of it could be policies like charter schools. A lot of them unintended consequences for these areas. And so one of the things I think is important here is how do we build brain regimes within areas that are struggling, marginalized communities? What I suggest is that we have to, there's a, a West African concept called Kitsan Kofa. Has anyone ever heard of that? No, it means in order to move forward, one must take two steps backwards. Sounds counterintuitive, right? But the whole idea is that in order to move forward, we must return to a history and reclaim that history. So there have been a lot of researchers around who have done work on the history of education, and they've highlighted this symbiosis that Dr. Tate talked about that was evident among predominantly black schools within black communities. Clearly, there was not the kind of abject poverty that we see in some ways, because black middle class did reside in those areas. But you had these forces, you had this relationship you had this symbiosis that was going on. Child was within the community. Child was not being educated by strangers, but people who had negative views of that child's ability. And so how do we rekindle some of that? It kind of reminds me of um, Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, who talked about this notion of, um, in order for people to move forward, one must close ranks. I used Du Bois, my colleague, Dr. Derek Aurich, had done some work around Du Bois intellectual thought. But one of the things that drives that, Du Bois had been a staunch integrationist. He had graduated from Harvard, went to Fisk University. So he really had this egalitarian view of race. However, once he saw the challenges around building interracial alliances with white people, 
poor white people and how they value their whiteness above that solidarity. Du Bois said, we've got to close ranks. And there been, there's been a lot of work. I've been part of a body of research looking at desegregation. But I'm wondering if we're at a point in society in which we have to think in more radical ways about creating opportunities for people and creating these by building on that which black people have and rekindling some, some of that, not in a naive way, but in a more strategic way, one in which we're bringing together researchers like Dr. Tate, we're talking, we're having conversations, we're also touching base with area superintendents. And when you look around like St. Louis Public Schools, Jennings, Normandy, Riverview Gardens, um, all these schools, Ferguson, Florissant, you have 90 plus percent student population that is black and 90% poor. You know, and so you have, that's the reality, and it's a reflection of that segregation regime Dr. Tate talked about. But how do we do that? And I think that's the challenge. And I think that's going to be important in terms of developing this brain regime within the context of a, an affirming and a supportive community. It will take resources, it might take the kind of resources that was used to rebuild Japan during World War II, or to rebuild Germany or to continue to um, rebuild sports programs. It's going to take money, all right? But it's also going to take polit political will. And um, I'd like to leave you with that because you know, there are a lot of different ways we can talk about this. And I think we need to have a few minutes for questions. But I thank you for the opportunity to reflect on your, your great work. It's been a wonderful scholar, great colleague. And I always learn when I talk with Dr. Tate. And also great, I want to hear the comments from this audience in terms of how to be really, and not just having critical conversations, but how do we take this to the point of having courageous actions and really do something? And I think we're at that point, not necessarily to talk, you know, but to really do something. And I, I'm just reminded about, um, I was reading Dr. Tate's paper. He talked about Harry Fannie Lou Hanger as a hero. You know, and I thought about, you know, where we are in terms of, uh, and I know the organizers talked about St. Louis, recognizing St. Louis as part of a slave state, you know, Missouri. And I, was, I watched the Harriet Tubman movie the other day. They just had a little glimpse of John Brown. Y'all know anything about John Brown? Yeah. Okay. A lot of, we weren't taught that in history, right? But John Brown was, he wasn't one to say, let's safely do something and let's have a nice struggle. He had a radical struggle. And that radical struggle was John Brown was not going to let slavery come to Kansas. You understand that? And that's the kind of thinking I believe we have to have. We're scholars who are part of this enslaved black population. Now we come out of those people. But you are mostly a white audience here. And I think it's going to take people to align but in radical revolutionary ways. It's not just talking. St. Louis is struggling. America is struggling. And there are some serious issues around race in this country that we all have to really radically engage and talk about. Thank you very much.